the purpose of today's discussion is threefold. We will divide the discussion in three different clusters. In the first one, we will analyze the role and the contribution of human rights defenders to the realization of economic, social, and cultural rights. That's cluster one. In cluster two, we will hear about threats and challenges that they face. And finally, in cluster three, we will look at good practices, which was the topic that you devoted your uh, last report to, the one that you presented uh, last week here to the Council. So look at good practices and also challenges in ensuring protection, but also um, identify necessary actions by different states. Stakeholders. So, uh, it is my great pleasure to start by introducing the panelists. I will start with Pedro, Pedro Tsika, uh, uh, who is que es uno de los jefes del Consejo de Comunidades de CUNEN, CUNEN uh, uh, in, in Guatemala, que es una organización comunitaria que se queda en el norte de Guatemala y que defiende sus territorios, sus recursos naturales y derechos humanos. Pedro también es un miembro fundador de la Iniciativa de Recuperación de la Memoria Histórica, una iniciativa que trabaja en la recuperación colectiva de la memoria histórica de comunidades de Quiche Norte, um, mientras promueve la rearticulación de la comunidad y uh, la defensa uh, de su territorio y derechos humanos. Um, it is uh, now my great pleasure to introduce to you the gentleman at the end of, of this side of the panel, Aru Chalvan from Malaysia, who has been working on economic, social and cultural rights, especially housing rights, uh, for the past, uh, well, over the past, uh, for the past 25 years. He's also the fo uh, a founding member of the Oppressed People's Network and has been arrested over 40 times uh, for defending economic, social and cultural rights. Uh, next uh, uh, to Aruchelvan, we have Awol uh, from Ethiopia, who is a fellow uh, on human rights at the London School of Economics, and he tries to integrate scholarly work with human rights activism. Uh, on my right-hand side, uh, I have Michel Forst, uh, who is, since June 2014, uh, the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights Defenders, and as I was saying before, the report that he presented last week to the Council was on good practices. And at last but not least, a lady who needs no introductions, but uh, since we are treating everyone equally, I will also introduce you, uh, 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 Miss Navi Pillai, who was uh, the previous High Commissioner for Human Rights uh, and uh, who is herself also uh, a human rights defender before, besides being uh, a jurist. And let me start with you, uh, Michelle. Um, uh, because in your previous reports, um, you have referred to a range of defenders who work on uh, specific issues, including uh, uh, those working to promote corporate accountability and sustainable development. Uh, what do you see as the role and contribution of these human rights defenders towards realizing economic, social and cultural rights? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Katharina. And uh, again, it's good to start uh, our discussion uh, with the name of uh, Berta Caceres. Uh, as Katharina said, this is a, a good example of those defenders working on uh, ESC rights that are currently targeted by, uh, by so many governments. And uh, I uh, started my interactive dialogue last week uh, by mentioning them. It was good also to see that uh, some, uh, some delegations, namely uh, Norway, but also the President of the Council also named the name of uh, Berta Caceres, and it's good to uh, name the, publicly the names of those who are targeted currently because they are fighting for the realization of economic social and cultural rights. Uh, you started by uh, uh, recalling that in my pre uh, previous report there was a, a long list of uh, uh, threats, uh, challenges, harassments uh, against uh, human rights defenders, but at the same time one should also recall that uh, uh, times uh, have changed, uh, and uh, we are currently uh, seeing an increasing awareness uh, mm. uh, in, the, in the population uh, in, in the world, be it only uh, because we have the uh, uh, anniversary of the, the adoption of the ACR, ESC mm. uh, right, uh, covenant. Uh, we have also the adoption of the Agenda 2030 uh, uh, with the SDGs. Uh, we have the COP21, and 
we also see a number of uh, people in the world, uh, an increased number of people who are speaking up for ESC rights uh, 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 and also for the uh, realization of, of those rights. Uh, for me, uh, as you said, uh, uh, the uh, United States defenders working on ESC rights are, first of all, agents of changes. They are trying to translate it to uh, uh, human rights language uh, uh, into uh, uh, a tangible reality for their um, uh, communities. Uh, and they are fighting for, for justice, they are fighting against inequality, they are fighting against poverty, against impunity as well. And um, what, is, what is clear is that their, their struggle take root uh, in uh, daily human rights violations. Um, uh, be it access to toilet and water, uh, Katarina, uh, be it access to, uh, to uh, how, right to housing, uh, inhabitants of, of slums, uh, uh, installation of electricity. So all those people are fighting for uh, the realization of, of those rights. And, and uh, for that, they are uh, really uh, uh, trying to, to uh, uh, struggle uh, in the good direction of the, uh, of the uh, ESC rights. I'm, I'm, I'm going to tie over. Um, thank you so much, Michelle. I think that at the end of this panel, uh, all the panelists, but also those of you who want to take the floor, we all ha will all hate me. Uh, but, uh, well, that's the way things are. Um, so now I turn to you, uh, 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 Navi. Um, um, uh, as, uh, 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 well, as a South African, uh, it, well, you, you know that your own country uh, has been among the leaders in promoting economic, social, and cultural rights, both at the international level, including here at the UN, uh, uh, and as it reflected in your constitution, but also in your national uh, law. So from your perspective, uh, how do you see the role of human rights defenders in uh, pushing for the respect of this provision? And I would, well, I would hope that, of course, that you share with us some of your experience as a South African, but I am sure that you must have lots of stories to tell from the time that that you were uh, uh, High Commissioner. So, can you start? Thank you, Katarina. You've, you started running already, and already. you asked me to do so many things. Um, so let me say that's true. South Africa is benefiting from having a good constitution that spells out equality and all rights. Now, that didn't just come about. That is huge push from civil society. I myself, as a lawyer, was in the Women's National Coalition, so it's the women who got together first. Uh, I first refused to go to that convention because I disagreed with all of them. There were church groups, women who wanted to retain polygamy, mm. which, which just showed when there are huge differences, you can still get together and formulate what we said was a Bill of Rights. Uh, for women and, of course, for the betterment of society. And we received the information from civil society. I was one of those who helped to draw a questionnaire. And we, from our ivory tower, thought the discussion was going to be on equity and equality. But no, what people told us from the streets, supermarkets, and so on, is they wanted economic, social, and <laughs> cultural rights. They wanted education for their schools. They wanted jobs. They want housing. So it's no surprise that we have a good constitution. And let me urge that that's one of the things that uh, human rights defenders aim for, is to get your good laws protecting economic and social rights. Um, my experience in South Africa helped me to handle the situation here. When uh, I became High Commissioner for Human Rights in 2008, I found there was a skewed emphasis on civil and political rights. Maybe that's what the donors wanted. Uh, and so when I tried to shift the balance and have equal focus on economic and uh, social rights, I was told those are not rights, they are aspirations. I was told by one minister from Europe that there is no such right as right to development because that's an aspiration and not come from the ground and not imposed from above. And you will know that the uh, Office of the High Commissioner of, of Human Rights has gone splendidly in progressing, focus on economic and social rights. How have they been do it, doing it? Exactly as the South African experience is to work very, very closely with human rights defenders because the work of human rights defenders is essential to the promotion, protection, 
and realization of economic, social, and cultural rights, such as the right to food, water, housing, health, work, social security, and education. <coughs> and human rights defenders help to develop effective Sorry. social policy to announce service delivery and advocate for access for marginalized and disadvantaged individuals. They also work to promote sustainable development and responsible businesses. And their work is vital to combat corruption, document and expose violations, pursue accountability even to engaging lawyers to realize economic rights through the courts. So their work benefits the entire communities and this is some of the positive role paid, played by human rights defenders and trade unionists on workers' rights in South Africa. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Navi. Uh, and in fact, I was thinking that one, well, we shouldn't be talking about the challenges but, uh, here but at this cluster, but uh, I would say that one of the challenges that uh, uh, human rights defenders in the area of economic, social and cultural rights face is precisely this uh, prevailing stigma against economic, social and cultural rights and the fact that economic, social and cultural rights are not acknowledged as human rights. Um, good. So, have, or bad. Uh, having said this, uh, Owl, um, there ha in recent protests in your country uh, or recent protests in your country have related uh, among other things to cultural rights of the population and let me remind you that uh, our uh, country is uh, Ethiopia as well as the fear of uh, land grabs uh, uh, am I right and could you elaborate on the role that human rights defenders have sought to play in your country to preserve cultural uh, uh, identity and resist these grabs um, thanks Katrina uh, I would like to begin by providing a very quick context to uh, the protest, uh, uh, and then uh, I will uh, try to explain what I consider to be the most transformative role that's played by uh, human rights defenders in terms of enabling resistance for these uh, policies of land grab uh, as well as uh, forced eviction. I'll also talk about the ways in which uh, local actors try to coordinate the threats against uh, foreign activists in terms of overcoming certain uh, local challenges. Uh, just by way of a background, uh, these protests are protests by the Oromo community. Uh, the Oromo community in Ethiopia are the largest uh, ethnic group for the Ethiopia and East Africa. They consist of about a third of Ethiopia's uh, one uh, million population. Uh, they are, in terms of numbers, basically larger than the population of Somalia, Eritrea, and Djibouti combined. Um, at the same time, these are communities that are extremely marginalized historically and excluded from the economic uh, and cultural life uh, of the country, and this happens usually uh, on account of their identity, uh, uh, um, not, uh, not in spite of their numerical majority because of it. <coughs> so the current protest, though it is uh, triggered by recent events, is very much uh, a reflection or a manifestation of a much deeper crisis mm -hmm. of representation, uh, equality, or, and the quest for, uh, for justice. So the immediate uh, trigger for the protest was the government's uh, unconstitutional and illegal expansion of the city of Addisaba, which is Ethiopia's capital, uh, to neighboring uh, uh, cities uh, and, and villages uh, uh, of Oromia regional state. Uh, the plan, as it was formulated, threatens to displace millions of Oromo farmers from around the city of Addis. It threatens essentially to uh, to erase the culture of you don't have a microphone okay. I don't manage to mute mine it's okay is it working is somebody listening to the interpreter oh it's working so please go on okay, okay thanks so the, the plan as it was formulated effectively threatened to displace millions of Oromo farmers from around uh, the city of Addis uh, including uh, uh, villagers who uh, see this land as ancestral to them, who have uh, a constricable link uh, with, with, with the land. Um, so, for the community, the, the, the plan is not simply some kind of economic and uh, uh, development initiative, but it is something that has a political component that aims to uh, erase Oromos and Oromo culture from, uh, from the area and also bring about uh, a radical demographic shift. So what are the ways in which human rights uh, defenders try to play a role in this, uh, in this context? One of the things they did is to create a bridge 
between protesters on the ground and uh, the international community, which includes human rights uh, organizations. Uh, so what they did is basically try to frame uh, the narratives and the issues uh, in terms of languages and frameworks or conceptual categories that people outside Ethiopia uh, would understand. So there are certain narratives that the government uses, which is basically to dismiss protesters as anti-development forces, anti-peace and so on and so forth. Protesters and human rights defenders basically uh, tried to overcome those narratives by re-articulating the demands in terms of the constitution of the country and also the broader uh, human rights framework. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you uh, so much, Awal. Well, sorry that I put so much pressure uh, uh, on you. But, uh, well, as we have discussed, I think it was important for you to get the complete picture of the situation and uh, uh, so that uh, we understand what we are um, uh, talking about. Um, uh, Pedro. Uh, uh, I'm going to address you and I'm going to ask you the following question. The indigenous communities that you are representing here today has tried to protect their lands against industrial development. Can you share with us which are their demands and can you tell us which has been the methodology that you have used in order to attract attention and promote uh, their requests uh, and achieve success uh, in your mission? Did you understand my lousy Spanish as a speaker? You can now use the microphone, please, sir. Thank you. I want to reply to the question that you have addressed me. Which have been our main uh, demands vis-a-vis -vis the projects? You said that you were asking us of, about the uh, indigenous community defending itself against uh, industrial development. But to me, the issue is quite clear here. Our demands in the face of uh, this uh, industrial demand uh, mean that if they want to develop industries, they have to destroy in Guatemala, and I come from Guatemala. Sorry, I didn't mention where I come from. But I come from a municipality called uh, Cunin in Guatemala and Central America. According to my experience and uh, to all the information we have, uh, in order to develop uh, industry, they had to massacre the population, they claim. They had to destroy the environment. They had uh, to evict from the land uh, the native communities. And that's uh, why we say this is not development for the community. It is development only for industry. And our main demand in the face of this repression and destruction uh, is that the human rights uh, should be respected. That is what we're really claiming for. The respect uh, for human rights, the respect uh, for the rights of indigenous peoples, the respect uh, for the rights of people, and the respect uh, for the rights of nature. That is our basic demand uh, in the face of this situation. How have we handled this? Well, we have taken this uh, to the Constitutional Court of our country because uh, it so happens uh, that Guatemala has ratified uh, international treaties, which means that they have uh, to respect uh, the rights of uh, the indigenous populations. But that is never the case in Guatemala. That is why we have uh, demanded before our government uh, and before the various uh, departments of government uh, that these international agreements in terms of uh, human rights should be respected. And what is the reply we got? Because we have challenged uh, these measures uh, which are grave violations of a human rights uh, have uh, been uh, um, taken to the uh, human, uh, uh, sorry, to the Constitutional Court. Uh, we should have got a reply in 60 days, uh, but only two years later, we got uh, 
a reply and it simply said that, that the case was dismissed. That means that, that, that both uh, the corporations and the government uh, of Guatemala hand in hand uh, are casting us aside. That is what we're trying to do. That is why we have addressed the Constitutional Court uh, to try to get a reply for our case. Uh, Thank you, Pedro, for your response. And, uh, in your, I, uh, when I introduced you, I mentioned your, your experience uh, in the area of forced evictions and, and the work that you have been doing in that, uh, in that area. Uh, looking back, um, is Malaysia better now than it was 25 years ago when we talk about forced evictions? Uh, maybe the, the glass can be seen as half full or, or uh, half empty. And what has been the contribution of human rights defenders, including yourself, uh, in that regard, in making sure uh, that, uh, that, uh, that the situation of the right to housing, uh, housing improved in your country? See, as, as I grow older, I think I, get, I will get arrested lesser, but that's not the, what's happening. Like, for example, last year I was arrested four times. And it, it really shows that the kind of uh, human right violation has not improved. And if you look in Malaysia, there is a rapid industrialization. Uh -huh. And what is happening is um, farmers, you know, those who are uh, farming, plantation workers are plantations are closing down for development. So a lot of uh, communities, rural people face eviction. And, but the whole nation is focused on this big corruption of the prime minister. A lot of money is said to be in Switzerland. But that is the highlights which is always in the local um, mainstream media. You know, everybody talks about the uh, political, uh, civil, issues. Uh, but actually, there's been tremendous uh, hardship on the marginalized community. And the human rights defenders are a small layer, actually. And they're not very much uh, recognized. So I think but over the years, I think because of social media and all that, a lot of rural issues could come up, you know, viral out to... to so in that sense, maybe some of these issues get highlighted. But in the context whether the human rights situation has improved, whether economic, social, cultural rights have improved, no. Actually, in fact, on the contrary, we are facing uh, more issues today than previously. Um, thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, thank you, Eric Chalvan. Um, well, one of the questions I, I want to turn to you, Michelle, but before doing that, one of the questions that, uh, and it reminds me of, uh, uh, brings together many of the things that, uh, that you said, uh, which are about how do we convey the message? How do we make sure that the message comes across? Um, um, you were talking about, Owl, you were talking about uh, deconstructing the language and the arguments used by the government. Uh, both Michel in his report, but also Pedro, they were talking about uh, the use of words like development of the country in order to show that, well, these human rights defenders are, are not supporting the country. They are enemies of the country. So how do you work with language? How do you work? Uh, what would be ideas for you, but also for others here in, in this room, to make sure that the message comes across uh, and, and, well, and, and that it is heard by, by, by the people, but also uh, uh, by the government. While you think all about these issues, I will turn again to you, uh, Michelle, um, to, to talk about the links, about the links between economic, social and cultural rights and civil and political rights. And one of the links can be between the right uh, to freedom of expression, freedom of assembly and association, uh, that are violated to prevent people to claim their economic, social, and cultural rights. So the, it's, this is a more legal, philosophical question. Should um, a violation of freedom of association be seen, uh, 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 be seen as an integral part of the, a violation of the right to housing, uh, for example? If freedom of association is being violat violated in the context of a, a, a protest or an action by a human rights defender. And if yes, what is the value added of this approach of seeing, uh, well, I will not repeat myself, <laughs> Michelle. 
And I would repeat as well. <laughs> but if you, if you look into the uh, reports that uh, are currently uh, presented by my colleague, special rapporteur, that are working on economic, social, and cultural rights, and your report, uh, Catalina, as well, uh, you would see that uh, uh, there is a number of factors that are facing currently uh, 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 problems, uh, as you said, uh, uh, having access to, to uh, building a, a community, building an association, um, uh, a right to peaceful assembly, uh, uh, freedom of expression, because they try to uh, simply defend the rights, uh, that are the economic, social, cultural rights. And uh, uh, when you look at the uh, number of communications that I do receive in my, in my mandate, uh, on human rights defenders that are facing uh, uh, huge uh, threats and problems, you would see that in many cases, uh, if they send a communication to me, it's because they are defenders, but also because they are uh, simply uh, facing uh, the problems with the uh, right to, uh, to assembly, uh, mm. right to association, uh, freedom of expression, and, and, and things like that. So that's why uh, it's very important to, uh, to look at the possibility to, to work better together, uh, meaning uh, special operators working together. And uh, if the current resolution uh, uh, is to be adopted by the Council, then uh, it is my intention to look uh, precisely uh, at how uh, I could better work with uh, some of my colleagues that are currently uh, uh, in their report uh, reporting on, on huge uh, threats facing uh, human rights defenders working on the economic social rights. Um, uh, thank you, thank you, Michelle. I, my instinct, did, uh, instinct was also to think joint country missions. Wouldn't that be interesting? I think that in your capacity as a, a, a rapporteur on human rights defenders, going with the current rapporteur on the right to water or food or housing on mission would be, we tried to go on mission uh, a long time ago. Good. So let me, let me ask you basically all the same question. Navi, in your experience, both in South Africa, but also while you were living here in Geneva, what are the, can you name some of the threats and some of the challenges faced by uh, uh, human rights defenders that work on economic, social and cultural rights? And also, to end on a positive note, how can this be overcome? And I will ask the same question to uh, all of you. Well, let me shout from here. This light is Does it work? on. No. Uh, I think who are cultural rights are partic particularly vulnerable where uh, states are involved in these uh, development projects with uh, mm. uh, multinational companies and so on, and so they see human rights defenders as people who expose parts of their concerns that they don't want out there. I've also spoken up against the uh, uh, extraction industry because governments tend to protect that by making it official secrets that the names of and the kinds of contracts that are entered into are not exposed. But may I take this opportunity mm -hmm. to talk about women human rights defenders who are particularly vulnerable because they work within structures and uh, w with states that tolerate violence and discrimination against women. And so it's a matter of huge concern that women and children are usually at the bottom uh, of, in terms of vulnerability and risk in any disaster situation, in environmental damage, in, in terms of how governments draw up their budgets. Attacks on human, women's human rights defenders include stigmatization of their work and can target the individual and their families. And this is perpetrated by not only state authorities, but also their own communities and families and other non-state actors. Any efforts to strengthen the work of women human rights defenders and to ensure their better protection must include women women human rights defenders in identifying, developing, and implementing such uh, measures. So the women's movement is very clear. They do not wish to be categorized as victims. Mm. And they want to be the actors. They want to be sitting in decision-making positions, and they want their knowledge and their dignity and life experience to be respected. 
So for these efforts to be meaningful, there is a need for structural reforms to eradicate violence and discrimination against women, both in law and practice, as well as to ensure accountability for violations perpetrated against women. Um, thank you so much, uh, Navi, also for, for uh, having put this focus on uh, women. It was actually one of the questions I wanted to raise, so that's good because we don't have enough time. Um, so, uh, may I give, I'll give the floor to Pedro. Pedro, usted puede un po hablar un poco de las amenazas. Pedro, can you tell us some more about the threats and difficulties that, that you suffer in your work as a human rights defender? Can you quote uh, two main difficulties you have encountered? Yes, uh, the difficulties in order to carry out our mandate in the defense of our rights. And uh, th there are many situations. Let me just quote a few in the first place. Because there is repression, there are threats issued by the government. I'm talking here, of course, about the government of Guatemala. And the threats that we receive exclude us from programs. When people are claiming for their rights, they are lured and um, Communities uh, remain excluded, uh, they are subject to threats. Uh, if you claim for your rights, uh, you are considered to be unruly, and therefore you are not entitled to any project. Uh, that is the very first threat they suffer. And then there are other items, for example, the threats, uh, but uh, the threats coming from the corporations, which are never quite direct. Uh, they come to us indirectly, and these are things that, that we see as a problem. Lately, for example, some 20 days ago, the army of Guatemala tried uh, to set uh, a uh, military outpost uh, in, uh, in, in an area w where there are indigenous uh, populations, and there's no need for that. Uh, in fact, the only problem that they have uh, is that there, there are demonstrations uh, from the um, in, uh, communities there. That's why they decided to send uh, the army out there. But uh, Guatemala is not at war. Thank you, Pedro, for giving us examples. Your example is very good. Uh, thank you again. Uh, so please uh, answer to this uh, answer this question. Uh, the challenges in Ethiopia uh, towards uh, human rights activism and, and towards human rights defenders is extremely huge, uh, partly because the media and civil society landscape in Ethiopia is extremely repressive. Uh, foreign NGOs cannot operate on issues of human rights and questions of justice. They are completely forbidden. Uh, domestic NGOs who receive more than 10% of their funding from foreign sources are not allowed to do that even if the government receives the majority of its funding to run the government from foreign sources, and also the government's own uh, uh, Human Rights Commission receives its funding from foreign sources. So I don't want to dwell on the irony of allowing its own commission to, to, to receive funding from foreign sources and prevent others from uh, using the same sources. But the point is that the, the, in order for activists to get the information out uh, uh, from the country, apart from the threat of persecution, apart from uh, the threat of uh, violence, mm. uh, there is a huge difficulty uh, in terms of getting that information mm. out uh, mm. to, to, to the public. Mm. So one of the things that activists has been doing actually to overcome these challenges is basically to work in coordination with uh, activists that are based uh, outside Ethiopia and get the message out to uh, human rights organizations and, and, uh, and the media. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Awal. Um, um, Alu. Could you also give us uh, some examples of threats? Well, you already mentioned it when we were under cluster one, but could you be more specific and give us more examples, please? I think one, one big uh, problem is the ganging up between the state and the corporations and how uh, the legal system, you know, there are cases where, you know, if there is trespassing. Trespassing can be a civil or a criminal, you know? Mm -hmm. But most of the time, if a community goes to the police station, complain about trespassing, they, they instead get arrested. And, and I think this is the problem because a lot of human rights defenders there 
are charged with many things, obstruction, uh, criminal uh, defamation, and um, what you call a rioting, public assembly act. So there's so many laws. So most of human rights defenders spend most of the time in the courts because they have to, there's a lot of court cases going on. They've increased bail. Uh, bail money has been uh, increased. And I think um, this is the problem we face. And some human rights defenders can't even travel to Sabah and Sarawak mm. because there's an immigration ban because they were fighting against logging. So there's a ban from them. You can't move to that part of the country. So I think how laws are used to intimidate uh, human rights defenders. And, and this, I think, is quite a serious, serious thing we face. Um, thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Arun. Uh, well, how laws are used to intimidate, but also how laws are used. This makes me think of a case I remember studying when I was rapporteur, and it was in the U.S., where uh, uh, an appeal court uh, of uh, uh, D.C., of the C District of Columbia, uh, uh, feared that information on them, them failures or chemical spills uh, could be used by terrorists. So the information is kept secret uh, because of the fear that it can use, and this is the case, I remember being on mission on another country telling me uh, a northern African country saying, well, information about water quality is a state secret. So if you don't have access to the information, then how can you make your case? And how can you break the discourse by the state that you are just being enemies of development, enemies of your own country? So without access to information and the, the use of law to intimidate, but also uh, to avoid you having access to this information, make things uh, complicated. Um, uh, okay, uh, 15 seconds. Very quickly, I think, you know, apart from the difficulty of accessing information, there are certain countries, Ethiopia included, where <coughs> courts, these are institutions exactly. of law and justice, institutions of truth and justice, are used as explicit tools, instruments to make sure that government policy uh, complies with uh, uh, these repressive, uh, repressive projects. Okay, thank you. One, uh, one example of a good practice and an example of a required action uh, by, for example, by, uh, by national governments uh, and by the international system. You already uh, went in that direction, but uh, please go ahead. Uh, that would be for me an impossible exercise. I mean, I, uh, uh, I present <laughs> a whole report on, on, on good practices. Uh, uh, just to say that uh, probably uh, one of the main challenges that the, the defenders are, are facing is that they're challenging uh, currently uh, a powerful economic uh, uh, interest. Uh, and with the uh, growing uh, demand of, uh, of uh, uh, like uh, rare earth, uh, things like, uh, you see that, uh, that now we're co coming across for a sort of a collusion between companies and, and, and governments that leads uh, then to, uh, uh, to um, uh, misconduct um, and, and corruption and things alike. So they have uh, to face a huge interest uh, having to fight against uh, non not only state but also non-state actors. And this is why we have also to change uh, our method of work. And currently I'm trying to do, and what this is one of my, my best practice, to try to uh, also target companies uh, mm. uh, in my letters of allegations. Not only government but also companies that are responsible for uh, directly or indirectly uh, violating the rights. And uh, uh, I've seen in, 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 some, in some cases, and my colleagues uh, uh, with the working group on business and rights do the same. Uh, we see uh, a number of good examples in which uh, companies currently do reply uh, to communications and that's something that we probably need to increase in terms of number and quality and then to observe uh, the response from, from state to see whether or not that we have the same level of quality uh, uh, in, in the responses. Uh, and then uh, one of the uh, good practices that we'd like to see is uh, simply, Katarina, the uh, adoption by the Council of the uh, uh, resolution on the rights. Uh, which gives us, uh, me and, and my colleagues, uh, the power to do more on the protection of, yes, of, of, of defenders working on economic, social, and cultural rights. Uh, thank you, Michel. So, a, a strong resolution me. by consensus. Yeah. A strong resolution, not a weak one. Um, I don't believe in consensus. You don't believe in consensus? Okay. So, a strong resolution, full stop. Um, 
uh, Navi, Michel was referring to uh, the fact that human rights defenders working in the area of uh, economic, social and cultural rights are like they are squeezed between business interests, uh, between uh, uh, the interests of corporations and the government. So they, they have to fight on very different uh, uh, fronts. Do you have ideas uh, on how, well, the business itself, but also the donor communities, states, etc., and the international community on measures that they could take to redress this power imbalance? Well, let me follow up on what you and Michelle said. I think it's very important, and the time is now, for the Human Rights Council to adopt a substantive resolution which recognizes the vital and legitimate work of economic, social, and cultural right defenders. This uh, resolution should condemn restrictions and attacks against these defenders. We, we have real examples given to us by activists here. It should contain concrete calls and recommendations to states, to business enterprises and other actors to ensure that defenders can work to promote and protect economic, social and cultural rights and contribute to sustainable defenders working to promote these rights without risk or fear. And a good practice would be encouraging developments such as the enactments of a national law on human rights defenders. Very few states have this, but some good examples are Cote d'Ivoire and also the increasingly active role states themselves have on environment where human rights defenders are also under threat, but recognize this and seek to address it through the development of policies and laws for their protection. Then, of course, there are regional mechanisms, particularly the um, African Union's Commission on Human and People Rights and its Special Rapporteur on Human Rights Defenders. They have sought to develop guidelines or best practices in collaboration with civil society networks from the region to address the specific threats against women human rights defenders and economic, social, and cultural rights defenders and elaborate specific recommendations on how to mitigate the challenges they face. And more particularly, what needs to happen is states should develop and implement in consultation with civil society specific national laws and mechanisms mm. to protect defenders and to investigate and ensure accountability for thre threats and attacks against them. States should be holding a dialogue with economic social rights human rights mm. defenders rather than locking them up. Um, national human rights institutions should develop concrete action plans to support and protect defenders, and they should establish focal points to ensure effective implementation and evaluation of such plans. And I know that Ethiopia has a national human rights plan. So if the government is locking up these voices, the Human Rights uh, Association in Ethiopia has a role to play. Particularly, they should have focal points to, to hear the grievances of people. Business enterprises, you mentioned, Katerina. Now, they have an important and influential role to play in protecting defenders and should be engaged in this regard. The Human Rights Council was wonderful. All the member states adopted mm -hmm. guidelines mm -hmm. for business and human rights. Now that should be implemented by states. What about donors? They should provide long-term, sustainable, flexible financial support to defenders and their organizations and networks providing for their holistic protection. The UN itself should strengthen the protection of defenders and prevent violations against them, including through the Rights Up initiative of the Secretary General and to ensure the uh, participation of and attention uh, to human rights defenders, women human rights defenders in various processes, including the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals, which I worked very hard towards and welcome that it speaks of rights, rights everywhere in those uh, Sustainable Development Goals, and announce its institutional response to cases of reprisals against those who 
cooperate with UN human rights mechanisms. We heard of one case there. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Navi, for this very complete, comprehensive uh, uh, and enlightening uh, response. Uh, Pedro, usted habló sobre la, la falta de, de consulta con la comunidad cuando están siendo... You mentioned uh, that the community is not being consulted when uh, large-scale projects are being uh, designed. The question is, therefore, can you identify good practices or actions something that the government at the national level can or should do in order to ensure the right to participation and uh, the right uh, to free and significant consultations uh, with the communities so that the conflicts uh, can be reduced and so that human rights uh, defenders can be protected. From what you said, it seems uh, that the military uh, um, Garrisons are not the best way of ensuring that sort of dialogue and participation. Can you therefore identify good practices that you might be aware of? Or can you recommend something? A good practice is what uh, the communities have started in some places in Guatemala. In Guatemala, we have more than 70 municipalities which now promote a good faith consultation between the community and the municipalities. And in other cases, it doesn't work so well. This should be a good practice. But what is lacking here is, uh, how can I say that? Um, in this case, the government, the government of Guatemala, should respect and should take into account within the legislative framework that sort of dialogue. So it would be a good practice to respect the decisions from the peoples, from the communities that have come out through that sort of dialogue, following their culture, their uh, habits, and nothing should be imposed on them. The communities know how to carry out these consultations using their own ancestral practices. So if uh, these practices are in place, I think that is a good idea. That is a good example that should be taken into account and therefore the opinion of the communities uh, to decide on its own life, uh, to decide on its development should be taken into account. That is very practical and it's very simple. It doesn't imply a lot of things. Uh, that could be a good idea, a good practice. And also I think that the most important thing is that we should respect the practice of human rights. That is also easy to do. It doesn't require much. It, what it does require is a strong willpower from the government. And that should be a good practice in order to find true governability for the whole population. And then finally, one of the other practices that could become very useful is to obtain recognition not only for human rights, but also recognition from the part of the government and from the corporations and investors and uh, the, the international uh, development agencies should recognize uh, within their projects the respect uh, to the rights of nature. That is something absolutely crucial for us. Uh, and if these criteria are taken into account, I believe that they will become very good practices in order to promote the participation of communities and thus find true governability, governance for each people, each nation. Because that will lead us to something we share, something that is shared between the governments, the corporations, and the peoples. That is nature. If there is no nature, people cannot have a life. But uh, nature is essential for corporations too. If there is no nature, neither governments uh, nor corporations nor even peoples would exist. Therefore, I think that could lead to a common understanding. Thank you, Pedro, for your support. To, to, uh, to
to Arul and to Owl. Uh, uh, yes. I think talking about uh, good practices, I think the last uh, seven to eight years, what the civil society has developed is a support system where there's a pool of uh, volunteers. Every time there's a big assembly or when there's uh, any confrontation, there will be a pool of uh, volunteers to handle arrest. And there's also, um, when police arrest people, these people will monitor, they will deal with the family members, and then they will also um, engage the lawyers. So we have a legal team, and, and this is now a, a very developed uh, team. And they go into all the areas where arrest happens. And, and the civil society has also set up what is called a freedom fund. So every time somebody is um, detained, mm. the next thing is they will be put, you need to raise money for bail. So we have this freedom fund, pool of money, so uh, people can bravely get arrested because you have money to bail them out. And um, so I think this is uh, something which has been developed over the years. And talking about one action the government should do is because none of the institutions we have are independent. Because we have so many institutions. Every time you make noise, a new institution is formed. We have the Integrity Institution, before that the Human Rights Commission. But none of these institutions are actually independent. Very recently, the government adopted what is called a whistleblower's protection. The problem is, the IGP, the Inspector General of Police said, the minute you blow the whistle, you lose your right. So that means, the role of a defender is you can't say something out. You have to secretly tell to the police, this is the violation. The minute you make it public, you lose your right to be protected. So there is a lot of times new laws, uh, new institutions are set up, but they're not independent. So there must be a mechanism where the public do play a role in ensuring that these institutions are actually independent, and then, they clear, uh, then you have more uh, credibility. Thank you so much, uh, Aru. This makes me think of something that I was looking into also for the work that I was doing. Uh, in his uh, 2000 report, the former rapporteur on freedom of opinion and expression endorsed nine principles for participatory processes. And one of the principles was, well, maximum disclosure, obligation to publish uh, information and disseminate it from the side of the government, promote an open government, limit the exceptions uh, to this overall rule, uh, etc., uh, and uh, and also the protection of uh, whistleblowers, which should be, of course, much more uh, encompassing than uh, the situation that you were uh, referring uh, that you were referring to. Okay, so uh, uh, I'll I'll end with you, Owl. Um, thanks. I think a lot has been said, and I would like to endorse the points that are put forward by uh, Mr. Foss and uh, Ms. Ms. Pile. Um, I would like to add two more points, and this is specifically in terms of how, uh, you know, multilateral uh, uh, institutions and uh, donor countries working with authoritarian regimes in the global south can actually hold uh, governments in that part of the world accountable. It is possible for them, when they provide aid, to make that contingent aid, that, that aid contingent on certain policies, certain principles and they can hold them accountable on the basis of whether or not the country has followed those policies and, and practices. And I think it is absolutely unacceptable that aid money would be used to abuse people in the global south. That is unethical, that is immoral, that shouldn't be acceptable. Just also with respect to, to, to the media, one of the great challenges for people in the global south to get information out is, is media. The Western media usually doesn't pick up information that is given to them or uh, uh, relate to them by activists on the ground. So they usually react only when uh, international uh, NGOs like Human Rights Watch or Amnesty International put out a report, and in most cases that is too late for uh, the international community to put pressure on the government. In most cases, these governments are not even aware of uh, some of these this, this things. So um, I think the media and uh, uh, multilateral uh, work Thank you for these very uh, concrete uh, recommendations.